having this webinar on the prostatic atrial embolization we all know it's this uh, very uh, interesting and upcoming uh, procedure which uh, we all are interested and in. possibly if we look financially also it can be a very great market and uh, but before that we have to understand whole whole of the uh, basic pathophysiology uh, what are the treatment options even the surgical options so where it actually stands we all should be aware of so that's why we have invited dr keith parera he is a assistant professor in division of vascular and intervention at dolg st louis university hospital st louis and uh, he is going to make us educated by uh, giving his experience and what what uh, what is the literature and everything what we want to know so dr keith uh, please start thank you I thank you the, doctor thank you doctor i request I request all the panelists to mute their mute their mics. Uh, thank you, everyone. It feels uh, feels like I'm doing ISVR again, like last year in Goa. <laughs> Just that it's, it's different. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you for joining in, and uh, you know it, to cover to cover PAE in one hour is very difficult because you know it's it's very different from <clears throat> from. You can hear me, right? Yeah, we Thumbs can. Up. Yes, yes. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, it's very difficult to cover all this in one hour. So, you know, I'll try to cover a broad overview. So like I called it a primer because it's really a basic introduction. Um, I'm thinking that most of you have done less than 10 PAs. I, this is what I gauge from talking to Dr. Gupta and uh, Dr. Someshwar and all my colleagues back in India. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm just sort of, sort of starting off about uh, about PAE. My name is Keith, as he mentioned. I'm from St. Louis University. I, I'm from India. I, I did my medical college in Goa. I practiced in Mumbai. I met uh, Dr. Someshwar, who, who uh, quietly influenced me to become an international radiologist. So I owe a lot back, back to my home. Uh, that's my Twitter uh, profile. So what we're going to do is we're going to touch a few topics here. Again, broad overview. Uh, and then we'll open up for questions uh, from the moderators and from everybody else. So we're going to start with a little bit of evidence-based medicine. Uh, uh, we have a urologist in the audience also who can ask me questions and please feel free to ask me. Uh, first of all, an international radiologist, this is a new territory for us. Uh, prostate beyond doing biopsies, I think was an unknown territory for IR, international radiologist. And so we didn't know much about this besides basic anatomy. So now we have to know a lot more about uh, PAE. So I think the first thing is you have to be a believer, right? If you if you want to convince anybody that PAE works, you have to believe in it first. So I think I'm going to go through a few things. Not much about uh, not much about details about uh, evidence. You know, not going to details of every trial, but just what you need to know to, to have a conversation. That's the main thing. Uh, where does PAE stand in other BPH therapies? So there are a lot of options. It's amazing the amount of options that have come out in the last five years itself. And PA is almost 10 years old now. 2010 was when it, when it was discovered or when it was started in Brazil and Portugal. Um, then we get a technical pearls. Again, this is, I think this is a huge, huge topic. This, again, we can spend virtually an hour uh, talking about this. So I'll get into some basics. And, you know, if eventually there is more interest, we can do something else in a few months or weeks, you know. Uh, and then practice building. I think Dr. Gupta spoke about this prior. Uh, how to start getting patients. And it's been so challenging for everybody. It's, it's still a challenge. A lot of practices in the US are still struggling with this. I think Europe is doing actually a little better with, 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 with this than, than, than US. Uh, so what's the rationale of PAE? Okay, basic thing. Hyper, so surprisingly, BPH is a hypervascular condition. Okay, that is the principle. So when you do embolization, you get ischemia. Okay, and then this is what happens in the box. This is what we know, right? Ischemic necrosis. So the prostate from being small, from being big here with a small passage here, shrinks. And more importantly, what happens is it opens up the urinary passage. So it's sort of, you know, there's more ischemia happening in the center of the gland than in the periphery. And that's very important to know because otherwise, like a fibroid, you're just shrinking the whole thing, which is not important. Most urological therapies happen from the inside here. Are you able to see my mouse? Yes. Good. Okay. So most urological therapies happen from inside. So it's important that we open up the gland from the inside. And that's exactly what happens. So it, it decreases the size of the prostate, but more importantly, it causes urethral decompression. Okay. So this is the big principle. Now, besides this, what we have found is 
<clears throat> now, you know, UFI, fibroid embolization, for those who do it, you know, we often compare UFI to PAE. And in, in a lot of ways, it is similar because it shrinks. Uh, but what we find is in PAE, the effect, the clinical effect is much quicker. So UFI, you wait for about three months, right? You see a patient three months, they're still like, oh, I'm feeling a little better, but still there are symptoms. Six months, they start saying, oh, I'm doing well now. PA is different. You know, you start seeing symptom improvement sometimes even two to three weeks after the procedure. It's dramatic. You know, they feel bad for a few days. And after that, they say, my God, my life has changed completely. And this is because there's, a, there's another theory that comes out. Ischemia causes release of nitrous oxide or nitric oxide. And that causes vasodilatation and decreases smooth muscle tone in the prostate that improves the urine flow. Another theory is that there's apoptosis, that is it's death, ischemia of androgen related receptors, which again, you know, it's a hormonal effect. It causes decreased disease progression. So there is a little more than just ischemia that is happening in the prostate, which contributes to the immediate and uh, dramatic relief. I call it really dramatic relief uh, from PAE. So they, this increases urinary, this improves urinary flow. LUTS is something you have to know. This is completely different from what we have heard before. Uh, BPH has got symptoms and the symptoms are called lower urinary tract symptoms, okay? So in, in, terms of quality, in terms of improvement of LUTs and quality of life, it is pretty dramatic, okay? And so let's go through some data. There is, you know, now there's a lot of studies coming out. Again, I said two patients described in 2010, and now in 2020, we have a lot of data already. Um, so what do we have so far? One is, uh, um, uh, I'm just, highlighting the main 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 data available. One is JVIR, a meta-analysis, which was published in 2016, okay? I mean, don't get in, we don't need to get in details about all these points and stuff, but just to tell you, in terms of subjective signal, subjective is what the patient feels, okay? There's IPSS, which is a score, which I'll show you later, which is a, which is a subject, it's a, it's a score of what the patient is feeling before and after, because often the symptoms change day to day. Like, imagine you, go to sleep and you wake up once at night. If you have a couple of drinks, you wake up three times at night, right? So it's a very, it's, it's a very, it's a very subjective thing. So these are IPSS and QOL scores are an are a, are a, are a, are a estimate of that. So IPSS is improved by 17 points, okay? Out of 35, improvement. This is, the, so a patient comes with IPSS of 25, it comes down by 17 points to about eight, okay? QOL improves by 2.45. Don't, don't get in details again. Objective, objective is, Things like you can see, you can measure them, right? Prostate size decreased by 31 grams. Post-void post residue improves by 85 ml. Qmax, Qmax is the, is the flow, is a pressure, is, is, is a total flow that is measured on the curve that improves. And all these things are highly significant. That means the p-value is significant, okay? What else? This is another very, very important and uh, point to consider the change in IEFF. Now, IEFF is International Erectile Function Index, function score. I can't remember what is the other F, but basically there's no change in sexual function. And this is a huge differentiating factor from a lot of uh, urological therapies like TURP, for example, T-U-R-P, you know, transurethral resection of prostate uh, has, you know, and I, I'm sure the urologists can relate to that, but has some incidence of erectile dysfunction, has some, uh, some incidence of uh, retrograde ejaculation, I think it reaches to about 40 to 50% retrograde ejaculation and stuff like that, which sort of is mostly unheard of in prostate artery embolization. So this is an important point that you need to, you need to look into. Complications, okay. Minor complications very high, 34%. It's a very high number, but I'll tell you what the complications are. They are sort of like an UTI. It's called a post-PAE syndrome. And I'm going to talk about that in, in, the, in the next few slides. Uh, it's high, but it's very common and self-limiting. Usually five to seven days. After that patient say, I, my life has changed. So it's minor complications, self-limiting. What about major complications? Blood transfusions, hospital stay. You know, PA is an outpatient procedure. So even one day of hospital stay is considered to be a big deal. Uh, major complications is less than 1%. And I'm going to tell you what they are so that you know what they are. Uh, and they're very rare. They're sort of almost described in case reports. Okay, that, that's how rare they are. Um, what about more data? Now, everybody talks about randomized control trials, right? Randomized control trials is, is supposed to be the, the best evidence that we have 
for level one evidence. So we have a lot of stuff going on. We have a Chinese trial from 2014. We have a Brazilian trial from 2015. We, uh, both these trials on top were international radiology run trials. So, you know, from a bigger perspective, not very useful, right? We want, we want things that are run by urologists and interventional radiologists published in urology journals. So in 2018, this was a combined trial by urologists and interventional radiologists published in British, uh, British Medical Journal, which is sort of not an IR journal. So it's, it's it can consider it unbiased. Uh, and it was followed for 12 weeks, okay? This was run by urologists. The first author is actually a urologist. Uh, and then this is just hot off the press, as you call it. It's run in Spain, again, uh, just, just, just recently published in 2020. Uh, and it's long-term follow-up of 12 months. The Switzerland trial was 12 weeks, which is very small, and this was 12 months. So what you, you don't, you know, we can get into every trial uh, at a later date and discuss about what are the positives and negatives. Were they, were they conducted properly? Were there any problems with it? But what is the take-home message from all these things? Okay, one is, I'll give you, an, uh, this is one example, okay? The blue is PAE, red is TERP, okay? The curve sort of go close to each other. The P value is not significant. What does this mean? And this is this is the main thing. IPSs and QOL are subjective symptoms. That's the main thing. Uh, it's a quality of life disease, right? The BPH is not cancer. You don't have to get complete response like HCC. You want improvement in quality of life. So that is measured by IPSs and QMAX. Uh, QMAX is objective, IPSs is uh, subjective. Uh, and what do you see in all these things? PA is equal to TERP, at least we cannot say it's superior, but at least it's non-inferior, which means it is not, not inferior to TERP, okay? Because they found sig sign similar significant clinical improvements in LUTs, which is LUT, low urinary tract symptoms. Uh, and, you know, getting into a little bit of details, what are the advantages over TERP? The advent one of the advantages is fewer complications than TERP. And we know, I've, I've told you before, the side effect profile of PAE is so good, uh, uh, I almost, we, we, we rarely get calls from patients a few days after, you know, maybe one call saying that, oh, I'm feeling terrible. My, my urine feels like terrible. I'm getting urinary infection type of symptoms. But after that, they just, they just don't call you. And when a patient doesn't call you, you know, it's good, right? Because there's no problem there. So very few complications, very few sexual side effects, no hospital admission, no blood transfusion, uh, no sexual side effects and all immediate complications. So those post-surgical complications are an advantage that, PAE has. Okay, this is just to give you a graph. This is from, this is again, red is PAE, uh, uh, TERP complications, blue is PAE. See the difference, right? There's a big difference in the graph. So that's where it, it's, it's a huge selling point for interventional radiology. PAE has got very less complications. What are the, what are the downside in relation to TERP? So this is all in relation to TERP. Technical failures are high, right? It is, it is, I would say it is by far one of the most complicated IR procedures. Uh, PAD is good. PA is, everybody says PAD is tough. No, it is all straight lines, right? Everything is going down. This is about climbing up. You go down to the pelvis, climb into the prostate. Curves are difficult. So technical failure is high. Uh, I would say technical failure is almost 50% in the first few cases, and then it keeps going down. Uh, clinical failures can happen, right? If you don't have a technical success, you can have clinical failure. And then this is another big thing that I spoke about, QMAX, right? The amount of flow that you have. Because TERP, actually opens up the passage much better. The flow is much better. So QMAX improvement, which is the flow improvement, is much better in, 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 in TERP compared to PAE. So these are the differences that you have. And these are important when selecting patients. So I'll give you a clear example. 50-year-old guy, okay, has got a large prostate and does not watch and is sexually active, doesn't want to lose any sexual function. PAE is, I would say, close to gold standard. A 80 year old guy comes with uh, urine retention and uh, catheter dependent and vascular is a vascular path. Uh, and you know, you want dramatic improvement, TERP may, may, be a, may be a better option if he's a candidate for surgery. So that's again, another point, you know, is he a candidate for surgery or not? But just to give an example, if you want dramatic improvement in the patient or he wants, he doesn't care about side effects. He wants, I want to pee really well. TERP is the best option. If he says, yeah, I want to pee well, but I want a good quality of life. I don't live in a diaper. I, I don't want to you know, have complications. Then PA is an option. So that is the huge difference between these two things. And I'm comparing TERP to PAE because TERP is considered gold standard. Okay, 
there are minimally invasive therapies which are close to PAE now, which are pretty good. So there's a lot of competition in the PAE space. And I'm going to show that to you later. What about long-term follow-up? We don't have much in this uh, to compare durability. TERF has got 30, 40 years of data, right? What do we have? We have 10 years of data. The longest published study is from, is from Portugal, which is six to 10 years. That's one center. The rest of the centers are three years, two years, three years, two years, which is not great. So we have to keep this in mind, right? Patients ask us, still, when will this last? We don't know, right? We have some data saying that in Portugal, there are 69% uh, success rate even at six years. But we don't know after that. We know that TERP is long lasting. So these are things that you need to keep in mind when talking to patients about durability. We don't know yet. In terms of PAE, we have, we have no idea about how long these things last. I think the mother, as I call it, the mother of all trials has been, uh, you know, from Portugal again, from Dr. Pisco and group and, uh, you know, that now Dr. Bilhem and, uh, and, and, and Costa, Nuno Costa, who have actually done a trial with the sham, which uh, I know in a lot of clinical world, this is, a, this is a great thing to do, but in the IR world, it's, it's impossible to do a sham. It's so difficult to do a sham study. And they actually did a good sham study over 12 months. Okay, now if you see this, this was the blinded period, period. And after six months, they crossed over because you know they found that it wasn't working as well. And it, it really turned out to be what it was supposed to be. The IPSS improvement was a sham, was dramatic and significant. The quality of life improvement was dramatic and significant. And I, I didn't want to spend time about other things, but prostate volume size, everything was significant between even the QMAX, which is objective was significant between PAE and sham. So, uh, it really showed that improvement in subjective and objective variables after PA are far superior from that to the placebo effect. And this is, and this is really the, the this was the crunch factor. And I, you know, I, when I visited uh, Dr. Pisco way back in 2016, I knew they were doing the trial. And in 2020, I'm telling you, I was nervous. I was like, oh my God, these guys are not publishing it. And is this really going to work? And, you know, they published this a few months ago and it, it published in the urology journal, European, uh, European Urology, which again shows that, uh, you know, it, it, this is this is this is real. This is real. This is just not a placebo effect. You know, people spoke about uh, multiple sclerosis and doing IJV treatments many years ago. Dr. Somesh was remembering those days. Uh, it turned out to be nothing because the placebo failed dramatically. But this, this, this is this is great because uh, again, uh, Ashwin, maybe we'll talk about this. But as far as I know, there's no placebo trial for TERP right now. Okay, it does not exist. So I think this is this is a big trial. The numbers may not be big. Uh, there, are, I think it was about hundred patients. It's not like a thousand in patients, but I think this is big in the IR world at least. Okay. So what about guidance? I think this is very important for us, right? Especially in the U.S., where everything is based on insurance. Guidance is important. If 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 a if a guidelines is not set by a society, insurance companies don't approve it. And so what happens is when a patient comes to us, they they don't want to do it because TERP is paid for and. And, and PA is not paid for. So NICE, which is the UK guidelines society has actually approved TERP. So they've said that TERP can be performed at a good center where people know about it uh, in, in conjunction with a urologist, like in a place where urologist also is involved. The American Urologist Society, and you know, I, I could have updated that, has actually not, not approved TERP. So we still, they still consider it in the context of clinical trial based on expert opinion. But the point is, they have not updated since the sham study actually came out. And also those two randomized trials, I think came out after the, after the last update. So we are hoping that probably in the next year or two, we should have an AUA, uh, AUA endorsement, at least for a few conditions. And I'm gonna to talk to you, what are the conditions later? In a few specific indications for, for BPH, we are expecting some guide, something to come out. Again, fingers crossed, uh, we'll see where it goes, okay. Uh, a little unbelievable, but you know, I hope it changes. Okay, so where is BP, B, PA in BPH therapies? And I, you know, sort of, I learned this a lot from my urological, uh, urological colleagues. We do a PAE clinic sometimes together, uh, you know, where I learn a lot from what they do. We have actually a clinic where we see patients together and they do some therapies also. So I learned a lot from them. And this is, it's so much, which I still don't understand, but I'll go through a few things for you to understand where we lie in this particular scenario. So BPH has got medical treatment, as you see on top, there are you know prost uh, homeopathic drugs, which are still used uh, by a lot of people. Uh, there's Flomax, okay, which is, uh, which, is, which is sort of standard of therapy. There's 
there's five alpha reductase inhib inhibitors, which is Evodart and all those things, which are great therapies. This is more short term. This is more long term. This is really, it really helps. Okay. And this has been proven over time. And on the left side is uh, major surgical therapies on the open prostatectomy, TURP, TUIP, TUVP, Holeps, great therapies, good, good, strong data. Okay. And these are the newer therapies that have come out now. These uh, transurethral, I think, needle ablation, uh, microwave therapy, uh, PUL or Eurolift, where they put staples and open up. These are minimally invasive therapies. So these therapies are considered to be missed, minimally invasive. I don't know why this is moving back. Minimally invasive surgical therapies, which have got a much better side effect profile. So these have got very good improvement of symptoms. This is a little less, but much better side effect profile. So, you know, I, 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 I put PAE in a lonely corner box here because they're considered to be minimally invasive therapies, but still not, you know, standard illogical therapies. So sort of yes, in the corner there, uh, sitting there. So this is where we are in the space. Uh, now this is, again, uh, disclaimer, I created a slide based on what data I have, but you know, on, on the right side is positive effects, so improvement on the left side is side effects. So let's take this, I took this from a urological publication, I added PAE there. Again, this is not published, this is based on what we have so far. In terms of drugs, okay, all the drugs, the improvement of IPSS, now IPSS is out of 35, right? This is improvement, so start at 28, go down to 20, right? 3.5 to 7.5% is, uh, 3.5 to 7.5 points is the improvement, 1.5 QL. Side effects, quite a lot. Erectile dysfunction, ejaculatory dysfunction, okay? What about TERP, okay? Significant improvement, right? 14.9, they feel much better, standard, gold standard. Quality of life improves a lot. But look at this, ejaculatory dysfunction is 65%, 10% erectile dysfunction, strictures, you know, blood transfusions, all those things. Let's look at minimally invasive therapies, Eurolift. Uh, Eurolift is a pretty neat procedure. It's very quick. It's almost done in outpatient practice. You don't even need an OR for that, right? It's much easier to perform compared to PAE. Improvement, not as much, but side effect profile, amazing, right? Almost nothing. Very good. Where does PAE stand here? <clears throat> Again, 17 is based out of small data, okay? This is not great. I don't think it is as, it's not, it's not greater than TERP. Don't get me wrong. I cannot put 13 here because Short-term data has shown that it is 17. So I'm, I'm putting a 17, the right number, but don't compare it to this. And I'll tell you the caveats why. Uh, but see the side effect profile. Minor side effects, 32%. Major, which is dark, 0.1%, okay? Very, very low. So this is where I think PAE has the huge edge over TERP, okay? The caveats, as I said, short-term data. We don't have much data here, okay? Fewer studies and very few head-to-head -head studies. There's almost nothing comparing PAE to minimally invasive therapies like Eurolift. It's very small, okay? So this is sort of where you lie, but you know this comes with KVR. So don't go to urologists and say that, oh, the PAE IPS is better than TERP. It is not. It is just based on what we have. The side effect profile, yes, it is better than TERP. I can, we have that data. Okay, this is based out of the LIFT ID study, which was published uh, some time ago. Okay, so we have a little bit of data where you stand. This is important to talk to urologists. Now we'll go to technical pulse. Uh, you know, I again, it's 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 long and there's a lot of stuff here, uh, but I'll sort of brush over basic details. So what we do is we do an HNP, we do CT angiogram and prostate. Uh, I tell you how important that is. We don't urology, we don't do two tests for Euroflow and UDS. Euroflow is peeing into a cup where you just get basic details about your flow. Eurodynamic studies to be sent to urologists. They put probes into your rectum, probes into your penis and check pressures. Basically rule out your overactive bladder or bladder conditions. Okay, so, you know, we don't do all these things unless there's a problem. And, you know, I cannot get into details about this in this particular thing, but there are certain factors that should point out red flags that these are not obstructive symptoms. There are irritative symptoms like overactive bladder. Okay, uh, so these are things that we could discuss at some other time. Uh, what we do is, what IRs do is, we do IPSS questionnaire, QL, IEFF. IEFF is same as SHIM, which is sexual function. IPSS, this is, I never heard of this before. Started using this about five years ago. It's basically seven symptoms, zero to five. You, 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 get, you get an addition of all of them, right? So four, three, four, and you add all of them and you get a score. And below here, quality of life, okay? 
What what are the AUA recommend, recommendations? IPSS score 0 0.35. For 0 to 8, conservative treatment, do nothing. Uh, if you're having three beers at night, decrease it to one. It may help with the frequency. Uh, 9 to 17, you do medical treatment. You do all the medical drugs. Okay, 18 to 35, you do surgical treatment. Again, this is blurred because it depends on amount of symptoms. Like a 50-year-old guy can have can have an active lifestyle, have an IPSS of 16 on medical treatment and wants to get off medical treatment because of side effects. So that doesn't become medical treatment because you want to get off medical treatment, right? So that, you know, is an indication to surgical therapy. So it's, 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 it's a lot of gray areas there, but it really depends. It's a lifestyle disease, depends on symptoms that you have. This is SHIM score, IFF score. You know, you basically check. This is mainly for research, right? Because you want to prove that uh, PAE does not cause change in SHIM score. So is it required? It's helpful, but it's not really required. But we do this all the time, okay? <laughs> Exclusion criteria, uh, I put all these things, you know, active infection, biopsy from prostate cancer, neurogenic bladder, you know, I think they're relative contraindications. They're not strict contraindications. You know, we have been getting referrals to do PAEs in large prostates that are prostate cancer now because they want us to shrink the prostate and do radiation therapy after that. So it is an evolving, it is an evolving scenario. Okay, so these are relative contraindications. What we do before procedures, we start, I, I start them in a lot of practices change, but I start them on two days and five days later of therapy with antibiotics, anti-inflammatory. It's basically a, a post-PAE syndrome, okay? It's not, it's not a post-embolization syndrome. You don't have fever and stuff. You have more of dysuria and all those things. So I put them on anti-inflammatory, of course, protonics and stuff like that. And pyridium has been very useful. Urologists use this a lot. It's in urinary antiseptic and it works really, really well. Okay, it has changed a lot of phone calls that have been coming to me after I introduced pyridium into their into their schedule. Um, secret behind uh, technically successful procedure, at least in my experience, has been a CT of the prostate. Okay, uh, sort of. I know it's a pain in the butt because you know you have to get that CTA done. You have to send them home, get them back later. Uh, but I think it has saved me because one is. Uh, it gives me a roadmap before I go in. Where the hell does this prostatic artery lie? Because the variants in prostatic anatomy are amazing. If you thought right gastric artery has got variable anatomies, this is this is the mother of right gastric artery. So CTA prostate is important. I have now started ruling out patients based on CTA prostate. Your prostate is too small. Your arteries are too small. I just cannot spend four hours getting into them. And what will be the improvement once you get into them? Maybe not good enough. So, you know, we sort of develop a protocol on a, on, a, on a grant from Siemens a couple of years ago, and we've been changing it as time goes by. And this is what it looks like. I, I know you, you'll, you'll get this on YouTube, but uh, you know we use this particular sequence, which most of you are familiar with, or you know have to tweak the protocol a little bit. We use a larger dose of contrast uh, saline tracking. But what we've put in the protocol is sublingual nitroglycerin twice during the procedure, five minutes apart. So we give 0.4 milligrams sublingual, wait for five minutes, give one more dose and then start scanning. It has dramatically improved our visualization of prostatic artery. And you know, if you guys read, some of you do diagnostic radiology and sometimes you cannot even see this prostatic arteries. You don't even look at that area. Nowadays with this protocol, we have been able to at least see the prostatic arteries and create uh, create stuff after that. What, what we do is we do processing, okay? And you can easily teach a text to do this. We do volume render reconstruction, MIP images. And basically we try to see the origin of the prostatic artery, okay? Uh, now, if you see it, it comes out here, as seen in the arrow, okay? Now, this is important because one is, you can see the origin, you know what you're doing before the procedure, okay? Is it stenotic, is it not stenotic? You can plan your time, right? Are you spending two hours for the procedure? Are you spending five hours of procedure? You can, you can, you can plan your day based on, based on the PAE that you have. Uh, the second thing, what I found very useful is, we actually lock the CTA with the C-arm angle. So, you know, based on the angle we get on the CTA, this is the angle needed to see the origin come out, right? Now I can see the origin come out here, right? I've made, the, I'm do, done an angiogram with that origin in mind. Now, if this was a certain different angle, I would not see the origin and I would be struggling. Like, is it coming behind? Is it coming front? Is it coming on the side? So this helps me see, and I've learned a lot of this from, from Pisco and his group in Portugal. They do exactly like this for every case, even after 1700 cases. Same routine, okay? And I think it's important to do this just to be successful, okay? So getting a CTA and following these protocols are important. 
I'll go through a few steps. Excess. How many, uh, Keith? How many? How many uh, phases do you take? Uh, one phase. Arterial. Ah, uh, no. Uh, plain and arterial. That's it. Uh, okay. Non-con and arterial. That's it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Even the non-con is, you don't really have to worry about. Just arterial phase. That's it. Excess. You know, radial femoral. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big radial guy for a lot of procedures. UFA almost 100% radial. TACE is 100% radial or 99%. Uh, for PAEs, I'm a little on the fence because a lot of guys are tall, right? And we don't have equipment that goes all the way down as yet. We have 125 catheters, 130 now. We don't have that. So, you know, I, I'm still 50-50 with femoral and radial. For radial, I use the Glide Slender sheath, 125 word catheter for femoral. Uh, either a long sheath, six French, because you want stable access over this. So for some of us who do PAD work, you know, you don't want this to flip out, right? There's a lot, lot of this are PAD patients that have acute angulations. I've been using this, you know, the Merit PPC Pisco prosthetic catheter, which is similar to the RUC catheter used for, used for fibroids. It is really amazing. I, I, I really like that for, it's, it's got a nice curve, which, you know, the, the, the guiding catheters have got like a, like a hockey stick curve. Uh, this one has got a U-shaped curve, which is, which is pretty nice. Okay, so it's something that you can consider. It's not very expensive. Uh, you can consider it. Um, so we get into it, do an internal iliac excess angiogram. So this is, you know, using a five French angle catheter or a PPC. Okay. We do a, use an oblique of LAO and craniocaudal. This is somehow, it works almost every time. So if you by chance don't have a CTA, you can use this as a rough guidance. Okay. Uh, craniocaudal towards the same side and, uh, sorry, craniocaudal up and left LAO, right side RAO and craniocaudal, okay? Works really well. Don't do the other side because then basically what you're doing is you're separating the gluteals and the pudendals from the visceral arteries, okay? That's the whole principle of doing ipsilateral, okay? Um, then we do a power injection run, okay? Showing a good angiogram. And then what we do is do a roadmap and try to get into the prosthetic arteries. You no, know, mag up, see the origin of the prosthetic artery, do a roadmap and then start at the microcatheter, okay? Don't use the base catheter again, prosthetic artery. Prosthetic arteries are very, very tiny, right? This is the prosthetic artery here. It's coming out of here. It's very, very tiny. So don't, always a micro catheter. So do a roadmap and then with the micro get into that, okay? I'll show you what we do next. So now you've got an internal iliac artery, done a DSA, got a roadmap, and now you're trying to get with, with the micro catheter. What we use is always less than 2.4 French. More than 2.4, you're going to cause spasm because the size of the artery is the size, almost the size of the, of the catheter. Okay, prostate arteries are one, 1 1.2 millimeters or 1.5 millimeter in size, or 2.4 uh, is about 0.8 millimeters. So you're almost getting there when it comes to, so use, my favorite is 2.0 prograde or 2.1 French Merit medical catheters. They have, Merit has got a lot of angled catheters, are very good. Your choice of catheters, but as long as it's less than 2.4 French. So we get into that and then we get, we do a prosthetic angiogram, right? This is what it should look like. Hemispherical, prostate, uh, you know, with the prosthetic artery there. Okay, this is this is the typical configuration of prostate. Uh, we do a DSA uh, and a cone beam CT, a lot of nitroglycerin, and we do a hand injection DSA. This is not power injection. It, you use a three cc syringe and gently inject. This is a very small vessel. You don't want to blast the system. Okay. Cone beam CT. I know we won't get details about this, but you know, hand injection. We do post processing, six ml contrast medium with you know saline 50-50. And I actually stand and inject while the sonium CT is going on, or I, you know, make our trainees do that to get the radiation. But uh, you know, it's important. Power injector is, you know, it it can. The problem is if you overfill, you're going to pull up penile arteries, and you're going to be like, oh, now is there, is there a communication? So you have to sort of do it. It's almost like a live process where you inject contrast. Okay, and you do reconstruction. The main aim of doing sonium CT is. Uh, confirm prostatic perfusion, right? You, you want to see that prostate is perfused here, not the bladder, right? And identify potential non-target because then you can decide uh, whether it's going to the middle rectal or pudendal or all those things, okay? Uh, embolization, uh, somewhere in the mid prostatic artery away from the origin, the endpoint is stasis. This is not like UFI where you do five beat stasis. This is complete stasis, okay? You want to get as much in as possible. What we use is 100 to 300 and 3 to 500. I've started using hydropulse from Terumo now, which is 200 micrometers, which is pretty good, but this is the average range, okay? A lot of data that is saying that smaller is better, a lot of data saying bigger is better, but in general, you know, it depends on the size of the gland and size of the prostatic artery. If, this, if it is a small prostatic artery, 
How are you going to put 300 particles there? Impossible. Okay, you'll get stasis in a few seconds. You want a lot of particles to go in. So then I started smaller, then go up a little bit. Okay, uh, embolization techniques. Uh, no, very slow injection. This is the longest part of the procedure. Getting the prostatic artery is difficult, but I would say this takes about 20 minutes per side, irrespective of what the prostatic artery size is. So you're already 40 minutes into a procedure just on the embolization part of it. Okay, that's why these procedures take two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four hours. Okay, uh, <clears throat> and then the amount of vials that you use is not like you we use 10 vials, 12 vials. This is one to maximum two vials. I've almost never used more than that. So it's a very small amount of vials. What to expect post-procedure? I think this is a great uh, picture that I found. Tell the guy he's going to be in the restroom for the next five days, okay? They are going to be in and out, in and out because of frequency. I, in fact, give them a urinal to go home with to keep by their bedside because they feel the frequency and disease and urgency. So this is what I'm talking about. Minor complications, post-PA syndrome, perennial pain, disuria, acute urinary retention can occur, hematuria can occur, hematospermia can occur, rectal bleeding can occur, small amounts. I'm I feel that this is even smaller in my practice compared to this. Major complications, blood ischemia, transient ischemic rectitis, radiation dermatitis, seminal vessel ischemia. Again, case reports. I think I would I would assume that you know over 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 10 years, we're close to about 10,000 patients in the world in PA so far. And these are four case reports. So that's the incidence of incidence of uh, major adverse effects from from PA. So it's very low. I said less than 1%. That's where it lies. Okay. Very low major adverse events. What we do for follow up clinic, I do an ultrasound, no CT, no MR. We really don't need it unless you want to document. But again, it's a lifestyle disease, right? If IPS has gone down, the guy pees well, why do you want to know what's the prostate size? Okay. So I just do an ultrasound in clinic. You know, your prostate was 80 grams. Now it's come down to 40 grams just to make them happy. But I think MRI and CTs is, is an overkill unless. You know, I mean, it's good for research purpose, right? You want to collect data, it's great. But I think uh, we, I think we have reached, we have reached over that hub when it comes to uh, clinical practice. Uh, we do IPSS score, QL score, IV, IEFF score. Pitfalls, and I'm, you know, this is a huge topic, right? There's a pitfall in every case because no two prostatic arteries, even in the same body, are similar. I'm going to go into a little bit about what the pitfalls are. This is, you know, anatomy and you know, uh, it comes, you can go through, you can go through a literature to find this, it comes out from the interpretive artery, from the SVA, or inferior to that. But I'll give you a small hint that I learned from Sandeep Bagla, who is, I've learned a lot from my, from my colleagues in IR. Uh, you know, one is how you, how you recognize target vessels. One is based on CTA, right? You know that that is, that is where it lies. So you know where to go into, right? The other thing is PA pattern recognition. So I'll show you this angiogram, okay? Now, this is LAO, craniocaudal on left side, okay, just to give orientation. Okay, the, the, uh, the base catheter is in the, okay, internal iliac artery, just at the proximal aspect. This is new anatomy, right? Because we don't, we have done this only in trauma and you feel, we have never done this before. So it takes some time to get used to seeing this anatomy. Okay, this is the internal iliac artery, superior gluteal artery, and this is what we call inferior gluteal pudendal trunk because it divides into inferior gluteal and internal pudendal. Clearly you can see a difference in this, right? Interpudendal artery takes this turn and goes towards the penis. Very clear orientation. This is, these are gluteal arteries that go to the buttock muscles. Look like typical uh, muscle arteries, right? Very different from this. Okay, go in detail. You see, you almost, again, this is not described in textbooks, okay? This is just a practical way of identifying. You see almost two vertical branch, two straight branches, okay? One is umbilical, one is pudendal artery, okay? Anything that's curvilinear in between the two, is probably the prostatic artery. Okay, so that is the prostatic artery there. Give me an, another example. Okay, two curvilinear branches. The low one is cut off. Sorry, but uh, okay, there's an obturator there which is coming here. It is not curvilinear, right? It's going straight down and making a fork shape, right? Very easy to identify. What else is curvilinear? This is curvilinear, right? This is the prostatic artery. This is not. This is from the obturator. This is the prostatic artery. Okay, so another another example. Okay, straight lines, umbilical artery and pudendal artery, a curvilinear branch between the two is probably the prostatic artery. Okay, easy, very easy, right? What happens here? All right, very confusing. Now there are multiple curvilinear branches. There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. God knows where they're going, okay? Very difficult to identify, okay? So 
I don't know. Uh, this, you know, that's why CTA is important. You need to know. Otherwise, you have to go to every branch and test it. Go there, inject. Half an hour later, go to the next one, inject. On a CTA, you sort of know which branches is going to the prostate. So, although it is simple, it is still complicated. Okay. Collaterals, the three bad boys: pudendal, middle, uh, rectal, and vascular. This is like your, uh, this is like your, uh, you know, road signals, right? Vascular, important. Okay, not very important. Middle rectal, important, not very important. Pudendal is extremely important. You don't want a single case of you know, penile ulcers. And they can happen. Okay, they can happen. They are self-limiting, but they're painful. The patient calls you all the time. Uh, you don't want this. Okay, you don't want this. So you have to be very careful about this. How do we deal with collaterals? We do coils and large particles. Okay, I would say pudendals, almost always you have to coil it. Larger particles are a disaster there. Middle rectals that are very small communication, you can get away larger particles so that you know they don't go to the middle rectal, go selectively to the prostatic arteries. And I'll show you one example. I had a lot of examples which you can do at some later time, but you know, this is this is you know the anatomy that I showed you. Uh, you know, as I said, straight branch here, umbilical, pudendal, the curvilinear branch. This is actually coming off the obturator. Okay. So I go with the microcatheter, get down there. What do I see? Right? This is going to the prostate. This is going somewhere down. Anything that goes below the pubic symphysis, I cannot show you here, but anything that goes below the pubic symphysis is dangerous. Okay. Anything that goes below the pubic symphysis. This is, you do a cone beam CT, this is going to the penile artery. Okay, direct communication. So my, my catheter is here. This is the prostatic. If I'm going to inject here, this is a disaster. Okay, he's going to lose his glance penis, 100%. So in a sense that not lose the glance penis, but it's going to have a lot of ulcers there. So this is a situation where you have to do something. You cannot embolize. So go down to that area. So what I did basically was I went to this area down here. I put a coil. Okay, and the question will be, it's a rare case, less than 1%, but what happens to that? Yes, they do have temporary impotence that lasts for a few months and it comes back, okay? Because there's the other side vessel always comp compensates. So as long as you don't put particles, but you do proximal embolization with coils, you're fine, okay? But coils here, I did embolization with photon hydropole, and this is a completion angiogram that shows that the prostatic artery is cut off, but there's still blood flow to the penis, okay? I, I don't have a... I don't have a later run, but it still goes down. So we still have maintained blood flow to the penis, okay? Patent penile artery. That's brief overview, okay? We can speak hours and hours about techniques of the procedure, but you know, I think it's, it'll be too much for you guys, especially who don't do it at all, to get into those details. Uh, practice building. I think this is where uh, this is where you start off, right? We, I think we have about 10 minutes for this. So I'll just quickly, it's, it's personal. It varies from place to place. Uh, people in Europe, it's different from US, different from India. In, patient, in people from UK, it's much easier to get PAEs because they're in socialized medicine. There's no financial incentive. In US, it's different, right? So all these things play alive. So it's really a personal plan that you have to come out with as a society in India and based on where you live. You know, you may have, uh, you may have certain, I mean, you have a lot of old, older urologists who don't want to do TERPs anymore. They want to do only office-based procedures. That's, that's a big plus for you. You know, tell them to send all your surgical, non-surgical candidates. So let's talk about how to how to get to do start how to get to start doing PAEs. Okay, one is you know attend webinars, talk talk to people, read literature, go to meetings. I've just put one meeting here, but there are so many meetings that are coming out every year. I think, and these are meetings for two days. Like you, what I've what I've tried to talk to you in one hour actually takes two uh, two days to talk about going to anatomy and you know, what not to do, what to do, so many details that, so go to meetings, online meetings, mm. and learn a lot about these things. Proctorship, you know, I think it's sort of, it's it's uh, learn one, teach one, you know, same principle. Teach people to do these things. Teach your own colleagues to do these things. Uh, you know, I was lucky to be proctored by Dr. Pisco, you know, now he's, unfortunately, he's no more with us, but the father of PA, who as I call it, I went and observed a lot of cases with them. They, they used to do eight PAs a day at that time. Uh, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, their techniques, how to do it, what not to do. And you need to keep seeing these things. You know, that's why live cases is a whole different thing. Uh, you need to see live cases. What is the approach? Uh, what to do? What uh, what catheter to use? So proctorship is important. And, you know, as, as people start doing more and more of this, you know, get other people to come and watch you doing this. And then you teach someone else. And that's how we have learned. I've learned from these guys. I've I visited uh, people in the US, learned from them. And now 
I'm, I'm inviting people to come over and learn from me because you know this we are all in this process together. We are all learning together and we still don't know much about it. So proctorship is important. Talk to urologists in primary care. Okay, uh, this is uh, an ICME activity that I did you know, two years ago. Uh, you know, I invited all the all the urologists in, in my area, and it's important that you talk to them about how you can help them. Okay, PA is not bread and butter for us. It is a part of our therapies for PPH. BPH therapies is bread and butter and life life uh, life uh, income for for urologists. So. We cannot tell them that PA is going to replace her. PA is going to take out everything. No, we can add to their, to their, to their enriching, uh, to their offerings for BPH. Okay, so talk to them about that. Uh, you know, they will not refer your 55-year-old healthy male with a 50 gram prostate. Focus on what you can do to help them improve the prostate health. So talk to them about what is the ideal candidate for PA. Now, an ideal candidate from an IR point of view is every patient, right? Every patient with BPH LUTs. After ruling out overactive bladder, after ruling out vascular disease, everything, almost every patient is a candidate, right? Because we do it with local anesthesia, uh, no side effects, you know, so many good things. But from a urological point of view, which are the patients that are ideal kinds of PA? So one is, you know, medical is first line option and you cannot compete with that. But patients have side effects, and it's a big problem. A lot of patients have hypotension from alpha blockers, sexual side effects from alpha, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So, what do you know? The patient's 50 year old guy doesn't want to undergo surgery and doesn't want medical treatment. That's a great place for urologists to say, Hey, can you do something for this guy? Please help him. Right? It'll remain the patient continues to follow up the urologist, but you help them with this predicament. Right? What is the other candidate? Y younger patient wants to avoid such sexual side effects, wants to buy time to surgery. Okay? Doesn't want to have surgery right now, but maybe at 70, he'll think of surgery. Okay? Think about PE. What about non-surgical candidate? This is a huge, huge market. You won't imagine. I think, you know, I was talking to uh, Giresh before this, uh, uh, Rune. Uh, you know, even if we can do 2%, 1 to 2% of the BPH market, that's enough for all of us to do some prostate. We don't need to do 100%. And so all these comorbidities are a huge, huge plus for us, okay? All patients who cannot be surgical candidates, large prostates, remember that, TERP is good up to 100 grams. Above that, TERP is a disaster. It's a lot of problems. You know, there's monopolar TERP now, but HOLEP is a big thing where they take out, enucleate the prostate. But very few centers offer that. In the US itself, very few centers offer that. I don't know how many places offer this in India. So large prostate, that is a gold mine. Urinary retention, okay? Some patients cannot undergo TERP, get them in. Cather dependency, get them in, okay? Because PAE is minimally invasive, no general anesthesia, size doesn't matter, bigger the better, okay? In urinary dependent patients, endoerosic therapies are not very prevalent, okay? Uh, and this is a publication, so one case report that really made me believe in PAE. This is way back from 2015 when I first did the PAE. It was a giant prostate, 502 grams. We did a, it was 10 years catheter, 10 years catheter dependent. And I say 10 years because he refused any surgical therapy. Uh, four weeks after the prostate, prostate PAE, his prostate size was down. Of course, the prostate size took a little longer, but he was off catheter and did much better. So. This is where, uh, you know, and Ashwin will allude to this, there's not much neurological therapy available besides HOLEP or a prostatectomy. So uh, this, most of the minimally invasive neurological therapies are less than 100 grams, okay? Urolift is less than 80 grams. So this is where, this is where you, you can help a urologist. You can help him help his patients. And you will be the savior in these cases. So talk to them about these, these particular instances. Refractory hematuria, you'll... My first referral from, from a urologist was refractory hematuria. They're such a pain in the butt to measure, uh, to control. You know, you do CBI, you do everything, nothing stops, right? You don't want to do a turp in them when they're bleeding. So embolization is great. This is a review article that we published in BGAUI along with some of my urology colleagues, which actually showed it's very effective, okay? Added to that is patients who are on anticoagulation. If you go through radial artery, as you know, you don't need to stop anything. I do on warfarin, platelets, everything possible. Get him in. Go through radial artery, you're done with the PAE. You know, you, the, your urologists are liking you if you start approaching PAE in this way, okay? Versus trying to compete with urology. Don't compete, you're with them, okay? They are, they are the owners of the prostate. We are helping them with BPH. Failed urological therapy, again, you know, patient doesn't want TERP. And a lot of men have started saying that I don't want TERP anymore, especially in the US, you know? So they are getting uro lifts and stuff like that, which again, not as efficacious. So if they fail urological therapy, they want another options. PA is a great option. And then as I mentioned, devascular the prostate prior to prostatectomy or radiation treatment. 
Okay, so these are the indications where you can talk to your colleague urologist and get option for them. So again, you know, PAE multidisciplinary approach is the best approach, but as as a rule in in, in the international world. You know, as all of you know, we are moving towards being a specialty by ourselves, right? We're an individual specialty. We have our own clinics. We see patients. We round on patients. We take care of patients. The urologist, the patient should not be calling the urologist for your PAE problem. You should be the one attending that, right? And so we are trying to promote most of IR therapies as an end solution rather than bridge to surgical intervention. And this is not about PAE, but about in general. So how did the father of PAE approach this? How does our approach change when you want to promote this as an end solution, right? This is Dr. Pisco, and they've done almost 600, 1700 cases in Portugal. And this is a this is a very interesting article he wrote. They're saying that even urologists in Portugal do not accept PAE as a form of therapy. So it's it's surprising that the father of PAE has actually said that his own colleagues don't send patients to him. So how did he approach this? He went to the people, right? And this is what the Society of International Radiology. Ashwin, I think you should I, I think you should uh, turn off the video right now. <laughs> But this is this is where you know I think in general we all know that interventional radiology has to go towards a patient focused patient focused uh, specialty. What have we done? Uh, we've done about 120 patients, not a huge number, but you know we start, sort of started in 2015. Uh, we have about uh, you know most of us are self referred and primary care, right? Urologists about half of them, and you know most of the urologists are non surgical candidates, and this is. You know, this is good to start off with, right? And when they start seeing good results, they start sending you more. So, uh, you know, we have gone on radio, done articles on newspaper, come on magazines. You know, I put a lot of op-ed articles in local dailies, you know, this is how it works. Uh, unit problem, there is hope. And, you know, this is, this is another big thing, you know, I think versus a huge difference when it comes to patient education is, we don't even put a urinary catheter in these patients, right? As men, a lot of men in the audience understand, you know, we don't want something, we don't want 16 French fully in our, in, 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 in our urinary system. But NPAE, you know, we don't even put a urinary catheter during the procedure now. We just do it and send them home. So I think that's a big, big, big selling point for, for PAE, you know, besides all the advantage of outpatient procedure and all those things. Be searchable, have a patient-friendly website. You won't imagine how many, how many, uh, link how many people are looking online most men these men are educated they're looking online for options so update that be on social media uh, you know ultimately we can build we can build a lot of awareness using just a hashtag pae because that's the as the future of medicine right everybody's on social media so using all these things i think we can at least get some reference from the community while talking to a urologist and getting some input from them uh, i think that's about it i have finished on time so uh, questions. Sorry, I could not cover everything in this time. Akil, good talk. Very good Thank talk. You. Very nice. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, is there is there any age uh, limit where you would not do PA? Uh, no, uh, but I would say once you get to 75, 80, depending on the vascular status, like, you know, in clinic, I ask them, before the CT, I ask them, are you diabetic? Are you hypertensive? Are you, do you have heart disease? If you have all those problems, you often have stenosis of the prostatic artery, unfortunately. So it does become a challenge, but there's no, there's no limit. And I think initially in the experience, you start getting those. So this is the problem. You know, you want urologists to send you patients, but they're going to send you the 80 year olds who have heart disease on anticoagulation, all those things. And then you have technical failure. So it is, I don't know what's the right right place to start, but that's a starting point. I think we should get an opinion from Ashwin. What does he feel? Uh, hi. Hi. Hey. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after this talk and even before this talk, uh, you know, uh, I would, uh, I would, ideally for me, a patient I would be referring for a prosthetic artery embolization is someone who can, cannot tolerate surgery or is somebody who's just not willing for surgery. So even if that patient is like 50, 60 years old and uh, as rightly alluded by Dr. Pereira, uh, vasculopaths uh, whom we probably would have multiple comorbidities and are not even fit uh, for surgery, you might have a lot of problems uh, negotiating your microcatheters into the uh, vessels. 
so that's a catch 22 kind of situation so but i think in our urology practice uh, someone who cannot tolerate surgery someone who's on antiplatelet medications someone who's interested very seriously about maintaining sexual function although such patients are very few in india uh, you know uh, although they don't uh, they are not very open about this uh, aspect in india as probably in the united states uh, and imperative indications where i would probably be referring is when a patient has a bleeding prostate as you rightly said it is a pain and we uh, take them to or multiple times evacuate clots uh, and as i was going through the literature a lot of them end up becoming catheter free after say 2 3 months you know many of them uh, become catheter free uh, so i would also like to make a comment here because a lot of uh, probably uh, people who are uh, you know getting uh, trained in interventional radiology that bladder function is a very important parameter that has to be studied in borderline cases especially vasculopaths who are long term diabetics so what we do with the urodynamics is not just about overactive bladder we see whether their detrusor function is good enough to make them void after any deobstructing procedure okay so which is a very important point uh, take home uh, thing i think that many people should understand obviously this is the urologist's uh, purview and uh, um, and i and it's beautifully put by dr pereira that you're i mean this is not a competitive field this is every urologist will tell you that they have a few patients in their practice who are who they are not able to do anything for like right now i have two or three people who probably after lockdown and uh, things like that i would be more than happy <laughs> to send to doctor <laughs> okay they are elderly they are 80 you know they they just not fit for a haircut let alone a you know surgical <laughs> procedure so get them a bit optimized and definitely uh, can offer uh, prostate artery embolization uh, thank you for the wonderful talk yeah. Ashwin, uh, so we have you have many options as uh, among the urologists for doing like uh, urolift, uh, but we have heard only the term. So, what is the actual practice, or does these procedure actually done in the India? And what 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 is the percentage? What, what okay. What? So, I think uh, Dr. Arun, you are asking about the other procedures apart from TERP that are done in the urological field. Yes, sir. So, uh, it's again uh, as was uh, told by Dr. Pereira. Every hospital has facilities. Almost every hospital has facilities uh, for laser surgery uh, now in India. But uh, the problem is not many people are well trained in HOLEP. So, it has it has a steep learning curve of, of about sixty uh, procedures, and uh, and it's time consuming. so even as as of today turp is the predominant procedure that is done the world over even in united states i guess and uh, holep is done in many centers depending on the training of the surgeons so i would say it's around 80% of turp and nowadays we do bipolar turp which is much better than monopolar turp in terms of surgical complications there's much less bleeding uh, it's uh, a bit faster and we can achieve much better hemostasis and uh, Uh, we do not see any tur syndromes what i think most of you would be having an idea that then, then they have the tur syndromes because the irrigant we use is saline uh, and that doesn't cause any tur syndrome so uh, so to answer your question uh, very few other procedures are done i would say in india the uh, ratio would be 80% turp and uh, remaining 20% would be a mishmash of holep uh, ktp laser thulium laser and uh, india hasn't really uh, eurolift hasn't made much inroads into india yet and yeah i think uh, that answers your question i think uh, arun just uh, let's take the uh, people who have uh, asked questions let us take them you know first before we can you right yeah. i can't hear you kit you can read your questions i will i'll just uh, uh, read these questions for you yeah yeah please start Karan has asked right versus left side prostatic artery. How do you choose? Um, like to to embolize. How do you choose? Yes, yes. <laughs> so in a radial approach, whichever the, whichever side the catheter goes, just choose that one. From a femoral approach, we do left sided first. Just that you know, the curve is it's like U V, right? We do left sided easier. Now what I've been doing now again, and I remind you of CTA, and you'll keep hearing this from me. With CTA, you know, you, you want to cut your radiation dose, right? It's important to cut your radiation dose. uh with ct i know which is the dominant artery there's, there's almost always a dominant artery so if there's a dominant artery on one side i go for that first because remember that unilateral prostate artery embolization is actually very effective very effective they have good relief of symptoms but it lasts for a short time 
So you don't want to try on the, on the bad side for three hours and then you're out of five gray and we have to stop at five gray or, you know, and then go to the other side. You rather want go into the, go into the size of your, your confident you're going to get into, embolize that side, and then you can take your time and then get into the other side. We often, when they're unsuccessful technically, we get the patient back in about three months. That's sort of time interval when those improvements start slowly wearing off and then we get them back. So the next question is, Aman has asked, what are the cases we should start first? What are the best cases? Which is a urologist is comfortable to give us? And I'll add something to it. What are the cases we should say no, that we should not do it? I mean, the thing is, you're trying to build a practice and your first case comes to the 80-year-old guy who's an anticoagulation and diabetic. Are you going to say no? <laughs> it's very difficult. I think... What you'll do is you'll do a CTA, okay? Do a CTA. Uh, that way the urologist also feels they're doing something, right? He doesn't feel like, hey, this guy is just thinking that it's difficult and sending it off. Do a CTA and see the size, see the prosthetic artery, see the size, and then make up your mind. If you think that this is easy angles, just try, you know? It's not, it's, I mean, catheter skills are so variable. You know, you, you may be in a small part of India and have great catheter skills versus uh, being, Paresh being in Goa, and having horrible catheter skills. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, it depends. So I don't think you can say no. But uh, ideal candidate is 60 year old guy who's non-diabetic and wants relief from sexual side effects. But you don't want to get that unless unless it's a friend friend of yours who wants to get it done. This is like Girish. <laughs> okay. well, the way your hair is. It looks like you are more in that category than me. <laughs> <laughs> Putting your hair out already. <laughs> so, next question is from Chandan. Problem, man. Uh, next question is from Chandan. He has asked, uh, he's from Ames, New Delhi, and he is saying that how do you convince your urology colleagues? And he has done, in last eight years, he has done only three cases. Try, uh, try to understand that he's at Ames, so, which is a government school. So there are not much finances and God like it in a private hospital that <laughs> but still he's not getting the cases I think it's just uh, awareness 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 I, I, I don't have I don't have a there are you know there are a couple of urologists in my own hospital who say oh man, I don't want to send any cases there's one urologist outside who feels that this is amazing so you know it, I think it's sort of there, there, there are there are some people who this will be you'll attract them it's like marketing right you talk to 20 people, one guy believes you, right? Similar thing here. And as I said, you need to do a few cases. You don't need to do all BPH cases. Uh, Arun, what I personally feel is, no, in a government hospital or a, where there is no finances involved, more important is that the professor or the head or whoever is more keen that their students learn TUPR. No? T -U -R. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. that's why they will not give you uh, okay. Whereas in private, there is a possibility you'll get it more than in a government. See, we had a similar challenge when we were doing uh, uterine fibroids. Yeah, yeah. We had a more or less similar challenge, and uh, I was I wanted to ask Ashwin. Ashwin is on. Ashwin is here. Yeah, yeah. Is there? Is so, there? Um, uh, Ashwin, I mean, basically, uh, this falls into turf battle kind of a thing at a point of time. Yeah. And when when you see a patient, uh, do you offer a possible therapy like this? I mean, you may be a right candidate. You might be really offering. But do you think urologists actually put it up on the plate and say, okay, these are various options. You can fall into any of these categories. And so, then guide them. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no. I'm not okay. speaking for myself. I would be speaking for the vast majority of urologists. Right, exactly. Exactly. It's not because of turf wars. I would rather say it's a lack of awareness that this hmm. is hmm. this has comparable results, and there have been non-inferiority trials that have been done, and right. uh, all about selecting the right candidate. So right. Uh, it's not so much because of uh, turf wars. It's mostly because of lack of awareness. I would okay. Uh, for my okay. Uh, that is fair. That is fair. I mean, I think if it is lack of awareness, then it is up to the IR society to reach out and probably, uh, you know, get uh, associated with urology and then find out a uh, via media or have some sessions with uh, urology colleagues. Absolutely. Great. Great. Okay. So, Keith, when are you coming to India next? 
<laughs> when you let me in, when you let me in. <laughs> <laughs> You so say, cargo planes coming in. <laughs> <laughs> so at present, at present, they are only carrying essential medicine. What <laughs> <laughs> prostate artery yeah. ambulance? Hello. Hello, prostate yeah. is an essential organ, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Kid, okay. Uh, so I think Swati has asked. When should we get urinary catheter out after PE in case of retention? Like means if the patient has presented with a retention, when should right. the catheter should be taken out? Okay. I think there was another question that said, do you use Foley also, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk to both. So we used to use Foley for our first 10 cases and it is very important to use it because you know you want to know where the prostate lies. So the Foley is helpful. After that, we gave up because our patients started talking badly about, started saying the, the, PA, the Foley was worse than the PAE. Okay, hmm. that shows how good PAE is. So we stopped after that. In terms of patients who come with catheters, so the people whom we catheterize right now is people people who are on intermittent catheterization. So they self catheterize because the prostate enlarges after in, in in the immediate period. They can go into retention. You don't want them to call you at 4 a.m. in the morning. Plus, if they go to a place where nobody knows about PAE, they're going to try to shove a foley into an inflamed prostate mm -hmm. and going to create a, create a stricture. So in people who have got inter, who are intermittently catheterizing themselves, yes, I put foley in them. Now, if patients have got foley already, we do a voiding trial at about three to four weeks. So, I mean, you can do voiding. I've learned to do voiding trial myself, but, you know, you can, you can send it to a urologist. You know, they'll be happy to see, do a voiding trial. You just take a saline bag, you put a catheter, you fill it up and then make them void and then put it back. But, you know, I, I think you better uh, leave it to the urologist. Three to four weeks is what we use so far. And uh, Avinash has asked, if you see cross collaterals from left to right side prostatic artery, do you still go ahead to the opposite side as well? And uh, along with that, there is another question from Karan. If multiple prostatic arteries are present, how do you test without cone beam CT for target versus non-target embolization? So one thing is, uh, you know, you'll have to get into each vessel and do a test angiogram. And that is that is what increases the time and you know of 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 the procedure because you're getting to one of them, uh, it's not this one. Getting the next one, oh, it's not this one. You're doing cone beam CTs on each one of them. You just end up getting frustrated and stop doing PAEs. And that's the reason why a lot of operators stop doing PAEs because they're in private practice. You do 25 cases a day and you're spending four hours on the PAE, your partners will throw you out of the practice. So that's where CT is important again. You know, I don't think CT is difficult in India to get. It is it is pretty easy. CT is available now. You know, it's not much of contrast from 150 ml, 100 ml of contrast, do a CTA, send him home. And the patient also feels like you're doing something, right? You're looking at something. So I think CTA has become really a gold standard. And, and uh, what about uh, the cross circulation? Cross, 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 circulation. cross circulation is very, very complicated. And it gets, you know, you, you inject into one prosthetic artery, you see a pudendal artery on the other side lighting up. You have to upsize particles. Sometimes you have to even go across the midline and coil the other side and then come back and inject. And that causes spasm of the arteries. These are complicated cases. And usually we see these in elderly patients who may have had prostate cancer in the past. Remember, prostate cancer is, you know, causes vasculopathic disease, right? It's called arthritis. So you see those things. So it, it can happen. So we, we go distal, coil, come back, inject, then go to the other side and look at it again. Because again, the other side, you can have two or three vessels on one side. Would the occlusion on one side lead to collateral flow from the opposite side? Arterial not immediately. Not, not immediately. No, not but immediately. these patients are yes. uh, vasculopath, you know, diabetic smokers or something, yes. and they have occlusions, and yes. then the opposite yes. side kind of yes. lights up a yeah. bit more. That, that's a very good question. So if you've got a, like a, you know, what we call a chronic total occlusion in the limb, right? Occlusion yeah. completely on one side, and the left side, then you embolize only one side. You cannot get into right. that one. Right. Yeah. Okay. One sided embolization helps. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Can I ask a question? Is is there a need to do PSA in all the patients who undergo P? Um, we 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 do it. We do it just to yeah. just to rule out prostate underlying prostate cancer because the, you know no, PSA no. drop PSA drops after after PAE right. So you may get a false indication that oh everything is fine and then ten years later you may have prostate cancer. So we do PSA for every patient. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, one point, I, one comment I wanted to make, sir. Uh, 
uh, many times when large glands, uh, even we do TURP of only one lobe and come out, especially if it's taking time or there has been some bleeding or some intraoperative event. So even uh, patients are able, a lot of patients are able to avoid even after one lobe TURP. So uh, doing it on only one side, if the other side is very challenging or is it uh, or is time consuming, is an absolutely valid uh, uh, point. Uh, uh, taking the PSA uh, aspect, PSA is a must, uh, I think, uh, especially in people who don't have prostatitis and all. PSA gives a fair indication along with the digital rectal examination as to whether we are dealing with prostate cancer. So that brings me to the question to uh, all the experts. Um, uh, has this been tried? And I, I saw a few articles that it has been tried in prostate cancer. Somebody was talking about it from the Oxford University where they have, uh, where they're thinking of using chemoembolization for a, you know, for a focus of prostate cancer. Yeah. Do you have any experience with that? I think chemoembolization has not been tried uh, in, in humans yet. Uh, prostate artery embolization has been tried in prostate cancer. And you know, the, th the theory was PSA comes down, right? So is it going to help? Uh, there was an article came out of, I think it was Russia. It, you know, I sort of got a translation from it. Uh, it says that you know, they did a histopath after and they found no change. So although it causes ischemia, the cancer remains. I don't think bland embolization is an option. Chemoembolization is something to be spoken about. There's one center in the US, uh, Northwestern, which is doing animal experiments with radioembolization for prostate cancer, radioembolization. Mm -hmm. uh, they they've just done 10, 10, uh, 10, 10 animals so far. Uh, it's, it's a long way to go. We are talking, even if it's possibility is gonna be 15 years. We cannot even get PAE to, to become standard. Prostate cancer is very far away. <laughs> in fact, uh, in our hospital HCG, where we have a PSM effect, and we use lutetium along with PSM uh, molecule, so that it go and settle down in the tumor areas wherever it is, even in bone metastasis, it's showing pretty good results, especially for uh, bone pain and metastatic uh, disease in uh, uh, cancer uh, prostate. We have done one or two cases like that when everything was done, when the other uh, parameters and other treatment were over. And fortunately, we have seen pretty good result with PSMA coupled uh, lutetium uh, treatment. Hmm. Okay. More questions, Arun? Uh, all the questions have been no, asked. No, in the There's chat. one question. Yeah. Sir, uh, one more question. Uh, Vinash has asked, sir, is large bl bladder diverticular a relative contraindication for PAE? Uh, Ashwin, what do you think? For yeah. TERP, would it, would it be a contraindication for TERP? So nowadays, the way we approach bladder diverticular is uh, mm. just like we approach any other case of uh, prostatic enlargement. If the so diverticular are wide enough, wide-mouthed, and do not have any other complications within the diverticulum per se. We just do the TURP or the whole up and come out. We don't deal with it separately. So I don't see any reason why this should be a contraindication for PAE as well. Yeah, I, I agree. We, sort of, we are we are going on we are going the back of TURP right now, right? So, the you know I, I've always Ashwin, I've always asked this question to my urologist. If if the patient has got a neurogenic bladder, catheter dependent for 10, 12 months, the, the success rate of most procedures goes down, right? Yes. But yes. but if, there's, if there is an obstructive component and an irritative component that is almost equal, would you still do a TURP? And they say yes. Yeah, we do. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where counseling comes in. Uh, so right. we do a urodynamics in such cases. And if we have an equivocal kind of uh, bladder pressure, which gives us a fair prediction of whether the patient will void after surgery, uh, we give the uh, we uh, we uh, offer this. We tell the patient about all this, and uh, many of them, I would say around 50 to 60 percent of percent of them, would say that we would go for the deobstructing procedure like URP. Uh, so it's a chance that they would have to take. So we have seen it, uh, maybe around uh, if the bladder pressures are very low, maybe around 30 to 40 centimeters of water in the urodynamics voiding phase. Um, I really don't uh, offer them, but if it's around 40, uh, yeah, around 40 to 45. Uh, it's pretty good. If it's less than 30, it's, it becomes a bit, uh, uh, you know, difficult to get good results. But in this neurogenic bladder, do you, uh, if you do a TURP, 
Mm -hmm. uh, do you get incontinence? Uh, okay, incontinence can is of various types. Incontinence can be because of overactive bladder, as in urgency incontinence. Uh, that's when so that takes some time, and that can be dealt even after the procedure with anticholinergic drugs. So the other incontinence uh, that occurs is because of uh, sphincter damage, as in stress urinary incontinence. So that happens uh, in overzealous TURP, wherein we go Correct. beyond where when we're doing a resection and damage the sphincter. So that takes time to improve and. There's a very small percentage of patients who require artificial sphincters after uh, overzealous TURP. Uh, so especially those glands which are like 300 ml and all that who have done staged procedures. So I actually think that's where um, interventional radiologists and urologists could collaborate. Why not I send you a 300 ml prostate where you do the embolization? I don't know if, I, if it has been done and I take him up for TURP because your results for a 300 ml prostate the patient might be catheter dependent for long or, you know, so why not I do a de-obstructing procedure? The advantage for me is I would have lesser bleeding when I go in. So that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the Ashwin, uh, so we have done a few cases, you know, like this, uh, you know, uh, so it's in the immediate phase. So in the first six months, if you do the TURP immediately, then it's pretty useful. They say it's it's much less vascular, so it's a it's a good thing. That's a good place to combine. But after 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 six months, then you know vessels it, it reperfuses, so the the effect is lost. Okay. The problem the, this is the problem that happens uh, with you know I, I don't know if you saw my slide on the mechanism of action of PAE. It is ischemia and a lot of other factors like ischemic apoptosis of the androgen receptors and nitrous oxide. Not very well proven, but basically what I'm trying to get to is. If you send, if a urologist send me a 300 gram prostate, which half of my patients are more than 100 grams, okay, uh, they have such dramatic improvement in the next few months that they don't even want to go back to urologists to do the TURP. And then when they have recurrence in one year, the, vas the vascularities go again come back. You know, the devascular effect has gone away. So that's that's the problem that we have in this situation. So I think uh, the question that uh, large bladder diverticular has relative contraindication for PAE, I think no. No, no, no. Okay. They, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. so we were discussing uh, about the possibility of taste in, in prostate artery. So I could see, I, I've just searched and there are articles on the human beings, even the PISCO. Uh, has uh, published the data of 20 patients who underwent days and I, I couldn't uh, right it's it's so, so that's but, but small, some small study and he has shown that the PAE the uh, PSA has come down with some some uh, survival right he, he's he's more looked at biochemical response so yeah 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 yeah, yeah. The, the problem is PA itself causes a biochemical response that's the yeah. whole problem with that you know so it, it did cause a drop from 20 to 2 which is pretty dramatic but the problem is there was no histopath involved in that. So the only mm -hmm. histopath results from Russia or Europe have shown that it doesn't work. So I would be very careful about talking, even talking about this in this situation right now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Amit Sahway has asked, do you prefer the perfected technique? Uh, very much spoken about. Uh, I know a lot of people in the US are doing it. The problem with perfected is you know, can, can you explain what is perfected technique? Oh, so perfected technique is so you know I, I showed in, uh, I showed you know the, we, we get in the prosthetic artery, but don't go too deep, right? We stay away from the ostium. The prostate is here. This is the artery. We go somewhere mid PA. Can, you can see my finger, right? And inject from here, right? So the the perfected technique is very counterintuitive. So for taste, what we do is we go as distal as possible and embolize, right? For maximum effect. Here you go proximal. Proximal first, you go embolize, then go deep into the prostate, embolize again. Now, this is it, what what the, the claim is that you you first get into the artery and embolize as much as you can because you want you don't want spasm. Mm -hmm. And once you have you have occluded, you can go distally and you find that a lot of parts of the prostate are not occluded yet. So then you can go and embolize. Okay, that's the principle. The problem with this is why I don't do it is. Uh, because you know you embolize here, then once you get into the prostate, there are always collaterals that open up. Because what happens is, the prostatic artery circulation is very dynamic, right? There are a lot of collaterals happening. So once you block one part, something else opens up. So I never do a post run actually after PAE. So once I block, I never do a post run because the post run is going to show you something dangerous. It's, they're almost always going to show show communication. Your your particles may not have gone there, but it's opened up because now you block this part. So the rest of the things open up just by this pressure going up. 
But so, isn't that isn't that good in the sense that if there were some collaterals to uh, open up after you uh, block the main, but I'm talking then... about collaterals collaterals to other other organs. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I should have said that. So other he, collaterals open up. If I have asked to, if I if I'm talking to a patient discussing about the uh, about the PA, what should be the percentage? I should tell that this is the success rate of PA. Uh, very good question. So. Uh, I think what we have data so far, I, I talked to them about, you know, three-year data first, okay? Because that's the most we have right now. Three-year success rate is close to 80 to 85%, okay? Mm -hmm. Six to 10 years, it drops to about 60, 65 to 70%. That's the numbers I quote. And Ashwin, what is the, what is the success rate of TERP? And do you actually discuss this, that this is a success rate and there is some possibility that uh, you, we might not succeed after the TERP? Uh, no, TERP. <laughs> so, because we definitely are resecting prostate. So, uh, indefinitely, uh, maybe early on in training and things, sometimes we see under-resected uh, glands, especially near the apex of the prostate, which can lead to failure of uh, removal of catheter. So, that is considered a failure uh, after TURP. Uh, again, if a well-worked-up case, uh, the failure rate should be maybe less than 5%. Uh, no, so I'm just asking, just asking that in, in any, like, see, we are saying that success rate 85%, that is on the database. So uh, the surgical data, what is the surgical data success surgical rate? Data, overall, uh, overall. Surgical data is, you know, 90% plus uh, from all over the world, uh, anywhere. Uh, so that is why TURP is the gold standard. Uh, compared to that, I would say HOLEP is equivalent, uh, but has a different side effect profile. Uh, so most of our... Uh, 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 figures have to do with com complication rates. So nobody talks about lack of success rates. So it's around um, 10 to 20 percent if you take all minor and major complications. So and that number is getting lesser and lesser uh, with every generation of technology of TURP itself that is coming in. So we have started even doing transurethral enucleations where we go in a plane and just enucleate the adenoma without having to resect. So that really decreases the chances of bleeding and things like that. So success rate 90% plus complication rate around 10%. 10%. So if we if we see if we see the data about the retrograde ejaculation, yes. so so do, uh, a urologist discuss about this that there are possibility of 90%. Yes. So see Keith has said that it is 60%, but if you see the literature, it ranges from 60 to 90%. So how do you discuss and how you convince the patient uh, that there is possibility of the complication of retrograde ejaculation from 60 to 90 percent yeah actually uh, retrograde ejaculation uh, we tell that this is going to be 100 percent forget 90 percent in a well uh, so most of the patients that come to us are looking for good voiding and uh, they don't talk about it but i make it a point to discuss about retrograde ejaculation and i tell it's going to be 100 percent because i uh, you know really counsel them that is going to happen uh, very few of them uh, maintain their uh, uh, prograde ejaculation. And uh, the uh, now we have some technical improvements in which we are doing certain technical uh, changes to the procedure uh, and preserving the TURP. It's called the ejaculation preserving TURP, EPTURP. So it's being practiced. It's valid for uh, uh, smaller glands, not for very large glands. Uh, but having said that, 60% is a fair figure. Patients accept it because many of them are going through a very bad time in terms of the thing. So there is uh, ejaculated dysfunction, but there is no sexual dysfunction. As in, uh, we don't get many patients complaining of erectile dysfunction. So people do achieve uh, retrograde uh, orgasm with retrograde ejaculation and the orgasmic function is the same. So even after uh, uh, radical prostatectomy, where we remove the prostate along with the seminal vesicles, people get an orgasmic function after they have recovered their erectile function, but there is no ejaculation. So uh, I know it's difficult to believe, but uh, we, we do discuss this and uh, we do learn from our patients because you really cannot go through all these procedures and then you know, say that you, know, you didn't tell us before. Uh, so why you say it's, not, it's difficult to believe it's quite believable. No? Yeah, I, because uh, it was mainly a radiological audience, so I no, I, no, no. I, uh, I wanted to be uh, certain no, no. on that. Uh. So, any other panelists have any any other queries? One 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 yeah. thing. 
at that age if i can get an erection no i'd be happy <laughs> so so as, as forget about the that part i think the most important part is that the, uh, the evacuation of the urine is the most important <laughs> रेडिएशन वॉट मोर यू वॉन्ट कोरोना करोना नहीं करोना अब तक नहीं ओके एनीवे आई थिंक थैंक Keep, thank you thanks a lot we had great talk thank you thank you ashwin thanks for being there yeah thanks ashwin that was good it was a great you. idea to have you so we get another perspective also so ashwin kahan se hai he is a urologist from uh, gangara gangara okay, okay 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 good so it was really nice it was a good session i think next time also let us get the clinical and radiology all put together and have some great sessions yeah that's sure, good sure. it was a thanks, great ashwin. experience thank you very and much uh, doctor as usual very nice excellent really learned a lot Thank i think you. we had about 80 participants on zoom and i don't know how many there were on uh, facebook usually there are 40 or 50 YouTube, 40 50 on youtube okay. that's good that's so good. good so Thank all you. in time we'll have more cases and keith keith one more yeah. thing is we will have another session where we go more into depth in it sure yeah maybe sure. after a couple of weeks or or a month or whatever sure sure, sure. okay 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 guys okay thanks guys bye 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 bye, bye. 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 bye.